a short introduction of who you are and then I'll go around the. Hi everyone, I'm Kate Brocka2 Positive. When I found out, I found Tracy um, two years ago, I think. Mm -hmm. My surgery was last February and I'm just on the board and here to help others. But like she said, I'm driving home from work, so it's kind of like awkward, but. <laughs> And I had my surgery at Sylvester, and I love my breast surgeon, Dr. Casmodel. So, thank you, Sophia. Hi, I'm Sophia Martinez. Um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer last November. I have a, I had a um, double mastectomy uh, in February. And then just last week, I had my tubes removed. So, um, you know, this is, uh, uh, I've, I feel this is a life <laughs> journey now. Yeah. Uh, but I'm very happy um, that I found all of you. And um, I'm always open to uh, learning any new information so that I'm just, I stay healthy and continue to move forward with this journey. Thank you so much for being with us. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> Thank you, Sophia. <laughs> Let's see, Mary. That we the people would include all the people. Oh, I can't hear you. We can't hear you. Mm -mm, can't hear you. I'll go on to the next one, Diana. Oh, hi. Um, I live in Melbourne. I just found out. And I just had my lumpectomy last Thursday, and on, on Monday I got the um, surgical pathology report that said it was in a lymph node. They did a sentinel lymph node removal, and I've met with a radiology oncologist, a medicine oncologist. Not happy with any of them, <laughs> and um, uh, so I'm I haven't started any kind of treatment since I just had surgery, but I am very confused about everything because I'm not getting much information from my doctors. And uh, they, they simply want to say, here, you do this. That's what everybody does. It's like, no, <laughs> I need all the facts. So I'm doing a lot of my own investigative work online, but I am open to what everybody has to say. Good. Well, thank you for joining and coming on tonight. Uh, Val? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, hi. My name is Viviana. Um, I'm BRCA1 positive. I spoke to you earlier today. Yes. Tracy. Yes. Um, I got diagnosed, I think it was like early April last year. And by Ju June 1st, I had my, um, my full hysterectomy. And seven weeks after, I had my mastectomy with reconstruction in, down in UM. Thank you for joining and coming on tonight. We appreciate you coming on and learning more tonight. Thank you. Thank you for having you guys too. I'm going to go ahead and start. My name is Tracy Milgram Posner. I'm the founder of Rocka Strong, where we educate, empower, inspire, and advocate providers, survivors, and survivors to eliminate the feeling of isolation and help you feel whole again. During COVID-19, we're unable to obviously come together as a community. So what we're doing is sending out packages. So if you or your family member or friend need a care package, please feel free to reach out to myself or Kate, where we can go ahead and get a package out to them. Tonight, we have Leslie Klein on to talk about nutrition, which I know is a huge need in our community as so many women with hysterectomies or breast cancer and treatments continue to struggle with weight loss, weight gain. So thank you so much for coming on tonight and dedicating your time to helping our community. Well, thank you for asking me. And I have to give you a little disclaimer. I normally do, I have a, a presentation that I call Fighting Cancer with Your Fork. And I thought, I don't want to do that one. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so what, I, what I'm actually going to talk to you, and you'll still get some nutrition information, but what I really want to teach you is how do you separate the facts from the crap? Wait a minute. Okay. Somebody's coming. Oh, I let her in. I'll let them in. Don't worry about it. Okay. I'll let everybody in. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm going to, hopefully I can figure out, wait a minute, I have to share my screen and then I have to find my presentation. Perfect. So, 
Give <laughs> me a second. I think I found it. I tried really hard to get this right. <laughs> Wait a minute. Oh, you got it. <laughs> Yay! Everybody <laughs> see it? It's on. <laughs> okay. So now you know how old I am because this was from the old dragnet. Just sex. <laughs> <laughs> So if anybody's young, they're going like, what the hell is she talking about? Okay. <laughs> so let me just start by saying I'm Leslie Klein. I'm a clinical registered dietitian. I'm the oncology, the clinical nutrition manager at Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center with the University of Miami. Um, I've been doing oncology nutrition for about 29 years. Like I said earlier, I started when I was five and, um, I have been working with the university. I just celebrated my ninth anniversary on August 15th. So tonight we're going to learn, you know how, and I don't want to get political, but you know how everything is fake news. I've been dealing with fake news for years. So this is nothing new. So we're going to figure out what's real and what's fake. And this is not okay. All right. So today, tonight, ah, it went back. Wait a minute. Okay. <laughs> it was delayed. That's why <laughs> I'm blonde. I'm not really very good with uh, technology. <laughs> okay. So the agenda tonight, we're going to, how to identify fraud and misleading claims, separating fact from fiction, and then living a healthier version of you. Ha <laughs> ha. University of Miami. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I got to move these around a little bit just so I can see. It. All right. Um, so what is health fraud? It's a misrepresentation of health claims and can range from a self-proclaimed medical expert who has discovered a so-called miracle cure to a food supplement or drug that is promoted with unsubstantiated health claims. So I think this would count as a health fraud. I've got a cure for the case of Mondays. Just buy a case of wine and you'll be great the rest of the week. Anyway, so, <laughs> so that's what a health fraud is. Nutrition misinformation is an exaggerated belief in the effects of food or nutrition on health or disease. So this comes from the Florida Citrus um, website, and it says, a common misconception about orange juice is that it's jam-packed with added sugars. In truth, 100% orange juice contains no added sugars, and the sweetness you taste is from naturally occurring sugars that develop as the oranges grow on the tree. All fruit has naturally occurring sugar that comes with many nutrients, vitamins, antioxidants, and beneficial plant compounds. Okay, why is that exaggerated? Oh, because if I ate one orange, I would get about nine grams of sugar. But if I ate, if I drank a glass of orange juice, I get 28 grams. And if I drank a can of soda, I would get 39 grams. So yes, sugar is natural. They didn't add extra to the orange juice, but it's still pretty high in sugar for somebody who's worrying about, you know, maybe you're diabetic or people always talk about sugar feeds cancer sugar feeds all cells. Sugar is a lot of empty calories that can lead to obesity. And we actually know that there are 12 cancers that have been linked to obesity and postmenopausal breast cancer is, is one of them. Okay. How do you select reliable sources? You want to choose most often sites that have a web address that either ends in gov, edu, or org. These are most often sites for government agencies, educational institutions, and professional organizations. You want to know what's the site's purpose. Is it to provide information or sell something? And you want to look for evidence. Now, the orange juice one was an org, but they are trying to sell you orange juice. So <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying. Okay. Um, if you're looking at print, like newspapers, books, or magazines. You want to examine the author's qualifications. He or she should be educated in the field of nutrition and dietetics, preferably hold a degree from an accredited university. So they might have RD, DTR, LD, or MD after their name. And they should also belong to some credible nutrition organization. If you're, on t you know, you're watching on television, you want to make sure that um, are the findings well-researched? 
can they repeat the study that they're talking about? One study doesn't make a finding absolute. You want to know that there's more than one study out there. And you also might want to see, do they have any follow-up stu uh, studies later on down the road? Okay, so when you're looking at reliable sources, is the information referenced with cited sources? You know, when they say, a study said, well, what study? Can you tell us what it was? Is If it's possible, you can ask, actually ask a, a nutrition expert about the source. Um, I know when it comes to political things, I'm constantly looking. When people post something, I look to see not just what the article is about, but where did it come from? Is it a reliable source? Is the information current? I've had times where people will cite, you know, information that's 20 years old or 15 years old. It's like there's more current information than that. And is the information informing or attempting to advertise or sell a product? And that piece is so important. What are they putting it out there for? What is the true reason that they're posting this information? Now, here are some red flags for misleading claims. If the recommendation promises it's a quick fix, probably not real. Claims that sound too good to be true are probably too good to be true. Recommendations based on a single study, like I said earlier, you know, one study doesn't make it. So dramatic statements that are refuted by reputable scientific organizations. So that one's been coming up a lot lately, not just in nutrition, but you know, when somebody says something and you go, really? I always thought it was, oh no, you know, um, list good and bad foods. There is no such thing as a good or a bad food. It's about making better choices more often. Um, stating that research is currently underway probably means there's no current research. Um, Non-science-based testimonials supporting the product. It's often from celebrities or highly satisfied customers. Um, wait a minute, there we are, I have to move you around. Individuals identifying themselves as nutritionists who have dubious credentials from non-accredited schools. So, you know, I've had people say, well, what's the difference between a dietitian and a nutritionist? All dietitians are nutritionists, not all nutritionists are dietitians. And we're going to get into that. Ooh. Okay, so we're going to see if we can pick out the expert or the fraud. All right, so this is Robert Young. He's a naturopath, an author, and an entrepreneur. He's known for the pH Miracle book series. So if you've ever heard about how you're supposed to be, um, you know, pH is so important. Cancer cells don't grow in, in the um, acid pH, so you want to be more alkaline. This is what he, he's done. Um, so he's authored a series of books and videos titled The pH Miracle, The pH Miracle for Diabetes, The pH Miracle for Weight Loss, The pH Miracle Revised, other books he's also authored include Herbal Nutritional Medications, One Sickness, One Disease, One Treatment, Sick and Tired, Back to the House of Health, and Back to the House of Health too. So he's got a lot of books out there. Um, if you look at his background, um, his website states that he attended the University of Utah on a tennis scholarship. He studied biology and business in the early 70s. He didn't graduate. Then he performed missionary work for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints for two years in London. He received multiple degrees from Clayton College of Natural Health, which was formerly the American College of Holistic Nutrition, which is not accredited by any agency recognized by the U.S. Department of Education. Um, Young's degrees include a Master's of Science in Nutrition, a Doctor's of Science with an emphasis on chemistry and biology, a PhD and a doctor of naturopathy. The prosecution at his 2016 trial <laughs> said his doctorate was purchased from a diploma mill and it was pointed out that he had gone from a bachelor's to a doctor's degree in eight months. Hmm. He's a fraud. <laughs> in 2011, the Medical Board of California began an investigation on Young where it discovered none of the 15 cancer patients that he had treated with his alkaline diet outlived their prognosis. In June 2017, he was sentenced to three years and eight months in prison. In addition, he also had to publicly admit 
He was not a microbiologist, hematologist, medical or naturopathic doctor or trained scientist. So a little scary that he was out there and had all of those credentials behind his name, but again, you do your homework. All right, so here's Karen Collins. She's MS, RDN, CND, FAND. Her occupation, this is her tagline from her website, taking nutrition from daunting to doable. She's a registered dietitian nutritionist. She's a consultant, a speaker, and a writer. She's known for uh, being a nutrition advisor to the American Institute for Cancer Research since 1984. As a consultant, she's worked on freelance projects and on, on ongoing relationships with nonprofit organizations, food companies, and food commodity groups. She went to school uh, at Purdue where she got her BS degree um, in dietetics and an MS uh, degree in nutrition from Cornell University where she was also an instructor. She served as a nutrition advisor to the American Institute for Cancer Research for more than 30 years. She's a frequent contributor to Today's Dietitian and maintains her own blog called Smart Bites. In 2019, she was presented with the AICR's first Distinguished Service Award, citing her expertise in translating nutrition research into empowering evidence-based messages. Surprise, she's an expert. <laughs> with over 2,000 nutrition news articles in print and on the web, Karen has helped millions of readers sort through nutrition information. As a consultant with such organizations as American Institute for Cancer Research, World Cancer Research Fund, and NASA, she breaks down current research into doable nutrition messages. Her professional memberships include the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, American Heart Association, American Society for Nutrition, Diabetes Care and Education Dietetic Practice Group in the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. She's also um, uh, in the practice group Dietitians in Business and Communications, the Oncology Nutrition Dietetic Practice Group, I'm in that one, um, Sports, Cardiovascular, and Wellness Nutrition in the Dietetic Practice Group from the Academy. So that's what an expert looks like in nutrition. Okay, so now we're going to talk about soy, all right, because this is something that, especially breast patients, I'll get this a lot. I heard soy was bad for me. All right. This, I swear to God, I cut and paste straight from websites. This comes from the paleoleap.com. If you follow what the government and food industry tells you like a broken record, you probably still think soy has some health benefits and it's a good idea to consume at least some. After all, what could be bad about the innocent soy milk or tasteless tofu? Everything is wrong about it, and we've been fed a bunch of lies. You have to consider the fact that all that you think you know about soy is the result of careful marketing over years and years that worked so well that everybody is now convinced it's a superfood that could feed the world and save the environment. If you head over to your local health food store, you'll find that almost every packaged product is soy-based. Most other products there are grain-based, which renders those stores a place where vegetarians go to ruin their health, but that's a whole other story. You know that Asians consume large quantities of soy regularly, right? Well, that's just wrong. This is what the industry wants us to believe because it's a common fact that Asians generally live longer and healthier than Americans. The industry then only had to point us to the consumption of soy products for Asians, uh, of Asians for us to believe in the health benefits of it. If you ask an Asian family you know, chances are you'll realize they don't eat that much soy. Promise, that was on the paleoleap.com. Now, why would they be bashing soy? Oh, because on a paleo diet, legumes are not allowed and soy is a legume. Hmm. Is soy bad for cancer patients? Well, there's current research that no harmful effects from eating soy foods. Eating diets higher in soy foods after breast cancer diagnosis improves survival. It may help tamoxifen work better, and soy foods are excellent sources of protein, phytochemicals, and antioxidants. That comes both from the American Cancer Society and the American Institute for Cancer Research. Now, I wanna just take one little step further that 
if you choose to include soy, it is a weak plant estrogen. So if your cancer is estrogen driven, people think, well, why would I want to eat it? Because the component in soy that is that weak plant estrogen, which is genistein, it's not metabolized by humans like other animals. So it's really not an issue. However, if something's good, more is not necessarily better. The recommendation through the American Institute, uh, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics is no more than two servings of soy a week, a, a day. That's either an eight ounce glass of soy milk, a half a cup of edamame, a third of a cup of tofu. And you want it to be non-GMO, the whole soybean. Absolutely nothing wrong with including soy because we know that inflammation is an intricate component to lots of chronic conditions, including diabetes, heart disease, obesity, and cancer. And the two main things that cause inflammation are sugar and animal protein. So you don't have to become a vegetarian, but if you can eat some plant-based protein foods, that means you eat smaller portions of animal protein to reduce inflammation. Okay. Okay. Oh, I just kind of talked about that. Does following a vegetarian diet reduce cancer recurrence? Once you've been diagnosed, you're already at a higher risk for either developing a new cancer or a recurrence of your cancer. All right. So this is the, the this is comes from the angelshealth.com website. Um, they're kind of like a, well, I don't want to call them a spa, but they're a retreat. Like you would go there for a retreat. The Gerson therapy is a natural treatment that activates the body's extraordinary ability to heal itself through an organic plant-based diet with raw juices, coffee enemas, and natural supplements. Our Gerson therapy uses intense detoxification to eliminate wastes and toxins, regenerate the liver, reactivate the immune system, and restore the body's essential defenses, uh, enzymes, minerals, and hormone systems. With generous, high-quality nutrition, increased oxygen availability, detoxification, and improved metabolism, the cells in the body can regenerate, become healthy, and prevent future illnesses. That, that sounds pretty good. Um, they also start, I think, like their, their small package, if you want to go to this retreat, I think it's $15,000, something like that. Um, according to the American Institute for Cancer Research, there is no clear evidence that a vegetarian diet is more protective than a mostly plant-based diet. Small amounts of low-fat meat and dairy foods included with your plant-based. And that's why we talk about the new American plate. When you look at your plate, two-thirds of it should be covered in plant food, one-third animal. It helps to reduce inflammation. Like I said, you can incorporate lots of plant-based protein so that you can have smaller portions of your animal protein. Is organic better? Okay, this comes from honeyandroots.com. The rate of cancer is increasing. Autoimmune diseases are on the rise and more and more of our population suffers from chronic diseases. While we can venture a guess as to the cause of these problems, in reality, we don't know. There is, however, growing evidence that environmental toxicity plays a key role in these and many other diseases. In particular, chronic low dose exposure to pesticides can affect your health. In other words, just eating conventionally grown foods can make you sick. Now, this was written by this person, Lilo. <laughs> they're, they're the writer of this blog. Lilo has an extensive educational and practical experience within the field of sustainable living and digital marketing. She has a medical background as a registered veterinary nurse, uh, a foundation degree in basic science and medicine, a bachelor's of science in international business management, a postgraduate diploma in Chinese nutritional therapy, and she is a certified medical laser therapist. So I'm not sure if that makes her the expert on organic, but is organic better? Okay, what is organic? If it's an animal product, it's grown without hormones or antibiotics, and if it's plant uh, product, it's grown without pesticides or fertilizers. 
There's no consistent proof that organic foods are healthier than conventional foods. What you should do is look for your local fresh produce. If you're buying something that's out of season and you're buying it because it came in from Chile or from the West Coast, chances are they put like a lot of wax and stuff on it so that the, the produce to preserve it in the shipping. So you're much better off if it's locally grown. Um, shop your farmer's market or co-op and buying organic is good for the planet. You wanna always make sure that you're washing um, your food safely and da, 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 the Environmental Working Group, which is a lovely website that you can go to, they're the ones that come out every year with the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. Now, organic can be expensive. If I'm eating animal protein, I would like to go organic. That way I know there's no hormones added, right? But if I'm doing plant-based, well, what do I do? You look at the dirty dozen. Those are the ones you should spend your money on if you're gonna go organic because those have the highest levels of pesticides. So that's things like strawberries. Well, this year, strawberries, spinach, kale, nectarines, apples, grapes, peaches, cherries, pears, tomatoes, celery, and potatoes. Now, you don't have to waste your money on organic if you are buying the clean 15. Avocado, sweet corn, pineapple, onions, papaya, sweet peas, eggplant, asparagus, cauliflower, cantaloupe, broccoli, mushrooms, cabbage, honeydew, and kiwi. So every year they come out with their new list. Again, it's just common sense, dirty dozen, yeah, go organic. Clean 15, save your money. All right. The sugar feed cancer. Oh, I mentioned that before. The sugar feed cancer. This comes from theheartysoul.com. Sugar and cancer pretty much go hand in hand together. But for some reason, oncologists fail to do what's necessary to stop their patients from feeding cancers with sweeteners and sweets. An increasing number of medical scientists support the notion that cutting sugar out cuts off the food supply to tumors and cancer cells. It's one of the easiest and safest ways to fight cancer. Now, this website has a holistic nutritionist on staff. And um, since the holistic nutritionist is still an emerging profession, many states don't regulate healthcare providers that use this title. So I'm not really sure what a holistic nutritionist is. Not sure that I would totally go with her. Um, According to the American Institute for Cancer Research, there is no direct good evidence that sugar causes cancer to grow more quickly or that depriving cancer cells will slow their growth. Sugar con contributes to cancer risk in less direct ways. Excess sugar and refined carbs can increase your weight gain and lead to obesity, um, insulin resistance, type two diabetes, which can then increase your risk of breast cancer and colorectal cancer. And so again, is sugar good? Not necessarily. Do I have to cut it out totally? If I tell you you can never have it again, you're gonna say you wanna bet. But if I say, well, instead of having sugar seven days a week, what if you only had it two days a week? That would be five times better than what you were doing. And it's about making better choices more often. It's a change in lifestyle. But we do know that there are 12 cancers that have been linked to obesity. So if you're eating excessive sugar and it's causing weight gain, then that's where you wanna start paying attention. All right, should I take supplements? Now that's an important one. This comes from the postchemonutrition.com. This one is an important website. Life is too short. Make the most out of what time you have left. Our post-chemo nutrition line has been formulated to provide an unmatched mix of a large array of nutrients you may need to get back to the life you love and deserve. Every person is different and may have different needs after treatment. Take our health quiz to see where you stand and get the supplements you need to get started today. Live an energetic life of love, vitality, and happiness. Now, the, um, the developer of this website is Dr. Dylan Foster. He's been practicing since 1997. He has, a de he has devoted his life to helping others regain their health. His certifications have led him from chiropractic into functional medicine then became certified as a doctor of pastoral medicine, and finally a certified oncology nutrition consultant. 
I have no idea what a certified oncology nutrition consultant was. So I looked it up and I found the tagline on the website that said, coach others on nutrition and wellness while building a lucrative business. So <laughs> again, what, what, why are we looking at this website? So you can buy the supplements from them. Okay. Should I take supplements? Food, we always encourage food first. You're actually going to absorb the nutrients better from food than you will from supplements. Not to say that I don't take supplements, but if you can eat, that's a better choice. Supplements are only recommended when there's a known deficiency that's being treated. I mean, right now I have somebody who is, um, he's, they're anemic. So we started with food and high iron and tried to work that. And after a month, numbers are still low. So now they're talking about taking iron supplements. But it, we don't always just jump right to a supplement. Unfortunately, there's no good science-based supplement, um, including herbal supplements, guidelines that exist for cancer survivors, and they need more clinical research in this area. And this all comes from the American Cancer Society. Okay, so here's some tools for your toolbox. I kind of brought up before about the new American plate. When you look at your plate, two thirds of it should be covered in plant food, one third animal to help reduce inflammation. If you go to the American Institute for Cancer Research, you will find the new American plate challenge. It's a 12 week interactive program. Um, it gets you eating smarter, moving more and managing your weight. Research suggests that the evidence-based recommendations not only lower cancer risk, but also help survivors. Now, what I like about this, if you aren't lucky enough to be working with a physician who has a dietitian available, um, they actually have dietitians on staff at the American Institute for Cancer Research. So if you signed up for this, every week you get an email, like on, I think on Saturday, and it says, start thinking like the rainbow. And then on Monday, you get your challenge. Why don't you try eating you know, X amount of uh, colors, you know, this week, you know, different colored foods. And then about Wednesday, they'll send you an email. Hey, how you doing on that challenge for this week? Um, it's kind of like having somebody like tapping you on the shoulder and reminding you what your goal is for the week. So they'll talk about nutrition, they'll talk about exercise, um, and they do have registered dietitians that can answer your questions. So it's just something to think about. My favorite, is the About Herbs um, app. If you have an iPhone, you can download it. It's not available on Android, but you can pull it up on the, on the, you know, on the internet. It's put out by Memorial Sloan Kettering, and it's updated constantly. There are two parts to it. There's the professional side and the consumer side. So I might see a patient and they say, well, my next door neighbor's best friend's brother-in-law said I should be taking soursop. It was really good for me while I'm going through treatment. And so we look up soursop, which is also known as guanabana or graviola. And if you looked it up in this about herbs, you would actually find what I like. If you look at the professional side, you can actually see the articles that they're pulling the information from. They'll, they'll have, you know, you can click on the little number and it'll give you the actual article. On the consumer side, it's much easier to understand. That one will tell you what it's supposed to be good for, is there any evidence, and then the most important part that says, do not take if. And so it might be, do not take if you're on diabetic medication, or do not take if you're on blood pressure medication, or do not take if you're on blood thinners. And so some things may actually be good for some people, they might just not be good for you. So again, I really like it because it's easy to, to understand and people mean well. They, when you get diagnosed, your little whole circle of friends gets diagnosed with you. And so everybody wants to do something. The way you feel out of control, they're out of control. They got to do something. They don't know what, but they got to do something. And so they may give you advice that you didn't want. Um, <laughs> uh, but you know what? Think about it. You're lucky if you have that, that support system. And so... A lot of people say, well, if I can't do it, then I must be in really bad shape, so I'm just gonna do it all. Be thankful that you have somebody that wants to help you. If they wanna do your laundry, tell them to come over to my house when they're done. Um, but why 
why waste your energy? If you're getting treated and you're exhausted from your treatment, why waste the energy on doing, you know, household chores when you know somebody else is willing to do it? If you have somebody that wants to drive you to an appointment, Yes, you're capable of doing it, but let them do it. They feel good. And maybe you're going to feel like crap on your way home. So you don't have to worry about it, but you're giving them a gift when you allow them to do it. Um, if somebody wants to cook for you, it might not be anything that we're talking about today. Maybe they're going to give you some deep fried fish, something or other. And you, but you know what? You say, thank you. And you shove it in the freezer. And then one day when you're coming home from treatment and you feel like crap, and you know you have to eat, and you go, oh, right, I have that in the freezer. I so you're always saying thank you to somebody for, for thinking of you, and that makes them feel good, but in the end, it really does help you. So just say thanks, keep your mouth shut, be thankful that you got somebody there that's looking out for you. All right, Old Ways. This is one of my new sites that I really like. I was talking to a group of, um, it was the Boys and Girls Club, and they were from an urban area. And I think I started talking about hummus and they looked at me like I had three heads. Like they don't eat hummus <laughs> in the hood. So, <laughs> so what this Old Ways website is wonderful. They take, it's a nutrition nonprofit helping people live healthier, happier lives. Traditional diets include Mediterranean, African heritage, Latin American, Asian heritage, vegetarian, and vegan. So if I'm working in Miami and I've got somebody from Cuba and, and they're talking about malanga or something, I have no clue what we're talking about, I can give them some ideas of foods that they're comfortable with, but with a healthier twist. And that's what this, this old ways, it's wonderful. They have, they have, uh, recipes and all kinds of information, but it keeps you kind of in your, your comfort zone by being able to look at foods that you're used to, but how do I make them healthier? My fitness pal, you know, everybody, I think since we've been working from home, everybody's gaining weight. Oh, they're eating from the time they wake up until the time they go to sleep. They're not exercising. They don't know what they're doing. You know, it's the, instead of the, the freshman 15, it's the COVID-19. So, so my fitness pal is a great way to just keep a track of what you're doing. I think structure is so important. I mean, I've been working from home since March and I can tell you every time I wake up um, in the morning, I make my bed and nobody sees my bed. My bed is upstairs, I'm working downstairs, but it's structure. I'm not wearing yoga pants. See, I got a nice shirt on, but I'm wearing actual jeans. Um, they fit me because it's structure. It's it gives me something to work with so that I feel somewhat normal. And you know what? I haven't gained weight since March. I've actually lost a few pounds. Um, but so the, my fitness pal is a great way to track your food. It's a great way to track your activity. Uh, fitness buddy is another one just to get some exercise in there. And they also have some meal planning and recipes. EWG, I kind of, uh, talked about that earlier. They're the ones that come out with the clean 15 and the dirty dozen. They also have um, the mercury calculator. And, I, you know, when I start talking healthy with people and I say, you know, fish is really a good anti-inflammatory, heart healthy, omega-3 fats, great source of protein. And they go, oh, but what about all that mercury? Because nobody likes fish. Although we live in Florida, we should like fish. I grew up in Maryland. I know what the Chesapeake Bay is. I didn't like fish. But you start making new changes, lifestyle changes. And the EWG website actually has a mercury calculator. So you go onto the site, you find the mercury calculator, you put in your information, and it comes up with the top fish that are best for you based on sustainability, omega-3, heart-healthy fats, and mercury levels. And you'd be surprised. Some of them are not wild. Some of them are actually farmed. Um, you know, I, I'll mention tilapia and people, oh, tilapia, that's a crappy fish. Well, no, it's not. If you get it from Canada, United States, or Ecuador, those are where you should be getting it from. So it just gives you a little bit more information, you know, facts, not fiction. Um, how do you find a nutrition expert? Hmm, well, you can ask to speak to a registered dietitian if you have a doctor that has one that works with them. 
if you're working at a, you know, if you're going to a university, there should be a dietitian available. Um, if you're working out of a doctor's private practice, they may not have a, a dietitian available. Um, if they don't, go to www.eatright.org, which is the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. There's a link that says find an expert. You click on it, you put in your zip code, and then it's going to show you all of the dietitians that are in private practice in your area. Now, they may not specialize in oncology, but at least you, that's a start. Um, if you are part of Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center, we have four dietitians on staff, and I'm hoping to get a fifth one soon. Our services are complimentary. That means you don't have to go through insurance. We're a piece of the package. Um, you just need to ask, as long as you have an oncology diagnosis, we can see you. Um, and we are out of cancer support services. The phone number to the office is area code 305-243-4129. You can call up and say, hi, I am a you know, patient here at Sylvester and I would love to talk to a dietitian about my, my cancer and they will set you up. And we're doing everything remotely um, and actually our, we're doing a lot better as far as um, seeing patients faster because we don't have to be in a specific site right now. So that's my food for thought for the evening. Any questions? <laughs> you can unmute yourself. I have a question. Yes. So um, I don't have cancer. I'm a previvor. Can I still call UM? All of my doctors are in UM. I only go to UM. Um, can I still call them so I can call you guys for a dietitian? So, and, and who is it that's speaking right now? I'm um, Viv. Okay, so Viv, you know what I want you to do? When you call, I want you to tell them that you saw a lecture by me and you want to see me, all right? And our secret is safe. <laughs> okay, that I want to see you, okay? No problem, yeah, awesome, you. thank you so, so much. You just say, you know, I, I, I attended this lecture and I'm, you know, I, I go to the University of Miami, I'm part of Sylvester, and, and chances are, as long as I know, I know who it is, chances are that sometimes I get that email that says, could you check this patient out? Because I don't see a cancer diagnosis. And sometimes I'll say, oh yeah, this is not for us. Or yeah, I can see, like I'll read the chart. I'm like, okay, so as long as I know who I'm looking for, in case it comes through that way. I'll okay, know. can I send you an email through the portal, through the patient portal? Yes. Okay, I'll look for you and I'll, I'll try to do it that way. Is that easier? Or actually, you know what? Wait a minute, let me stop sharing. Okay, here we are. And if we go to chat. Yep, you can go right in the chat and I might get rid of that. Okay, chat. Oh, okay. Here's my message. L K L E I N at M E D dot Miami dot E D U. There I am. Thank so you. Now, if you had asked me to do this in March, I wouldn't know what the hell I was doing. <laughs> the advances that you've had to learn right through this chocolate. <laughs> I, it was so bad. I never used my laptop. And when I started, I was like, oh, crap. My boyfriend had to give me my mouse because I couldn't do it without him. <laughs> yeah, I'm sad. But anyway. Um, I have a question, and I don't know, maybe you could touch base on it a little bit. Sure. I know something that comes up, you know, either for our survivors or survivors or thrivers, for anybody, you know, weight gain and a hysterectomy with no hormones. Mm -hmm. Do you have any guidance on, like, obviously there's no, like, information out there. Everybody knows, you know, weight gain comes along with no hormones and a hysterectomy and getting older. But I feel like, obviously, you know, a lot of us can say that we know, like, what foods trigger it. Like, I spoke to somebody today, well, wine it was funny when I talked to her, she's like, well, wine bothers me. I'm like, I couldn't even, I, to have wine is to kill me. Um, for Rosh Hashanah, I was at my mom's house. I nearly died. I had Manischewitz. I've been drinking it since <laughs> I'm a kid. I'm like, this is my favorite wine. Like, I can't drink it. It's like, obviously I know like foods are triggers, but like for the weight gain side of it. like, Oh, here, I'll give you, I'll give you a quick little, a little 
synopsis of weight gain. I have struggled all my life, okay? And that's why I've been very proud that I haven't gained weight since March. <laughs> now, depending on what, um, like if you don't have any medications that require food, there's a lot of uh, research out there now on intermittent fasting, okay? So intermittent fasting is basically saying, how do I use the fat that I have stored instead of my carbohydrates, which are the preferred source of energy for my body, all right? right? It takes eight hours after you've eaten for your body to get over the carbs, because that's the easy way out, um, to switch over to, to fat. So if I eat breakfast at eight o'clock and lunch at noon and a snack at 3.30 and dinner at seven and another snack at nine, there's never eight hours between. So I'm always, every time I eat, I'm just gonna be using my carbs. If you do intermittent fasting, what you do is you come up, the, the, it's a lifestyle change. Diets don't work. Beginning, end, failure, somewhere in between, all right? So what you do is you come up with what works for you. I started doing intermittent fasting about two and a half years ago, and I live in Boca, and I'm working in Miami three days a week, and I was taking the train. It was a four-hour commute each day. Two hours down, two hours back, because I had to switch from tri-rail to metro and wait for the train, and then you missed it, and blah, 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 blah. So what I decided, I run out of my house at 5 o'clock in the morning to go grab that train. I get on it at 5.17. I'm in Miami, in the office at 10 minutes to 7. I'm trying to leave by 4 o'clock, get on the train, and I'm home eh, around 6-ish. And now i got to make dinner. Well, I decided I wanted to be normal around my boyfriend because we do dinner. We go out. I, I didn't want him going like sabotaging me. So I said, I want to be normal around him. So I decided we never eat dinner before seven. And if we go out, maybe the, the waiter's having a bad time. So maybe we won't get served until really late. I'll be done with dinner by nine. So what I did is I backed into it. My eight hour window of eating is from one o'clock in the afternoon till nine o'clock at night. That works for me. All right which means when I finish eating at nine o'clock at night, 10, 11, 12, one, two, three, four, five. Five o'clock in the morning is eight hours later. As I'm running out the door to go catch my train, I now start burning fat as my source of energy. So I am literally running from the tri route of the metro and I'm walking from the metro to my office and then I'm running around the, the, the hospital campus seeing patients and I'm burning fat. And then I eat lunch at one o'clock and I eat my normal lunch. And then when I get home, I eat my normal dinner with my, with my boyfriend. And what I found the hardest thing is the 16 hours of fasting, it's not Yom Kippur fasting. Trust me, it was so much easier because you have to stay hydrated. So you have to drink the whole time. So now the only problem is you can't have calories during those 16 hours of fasting. I found out very quickly, I hated black coffee. Well, if you get rid of five cups of coffee with cream, guess what? You lose weight. Hey. So, but I really wanted my coffee. How do I drink my coffee black? Cause I'm not enjoying this. I tried tea. I tried, it wasn't working. It took me eight months. I'll give you my, uh, my tip. I, I have my curry instead of buying the K cups. I have a little K cup filter and I put my own coffee in there and then I sprinkle cinnamon in it. And then when it brews, the cinnamon comes through. It has such a nice flavor. I don't need cream. I put a little Splenda in, but that's it. So now I can drink coffee black, but until I could do that, how did I get through it? All, the, all morning long, oh, I'm missing my coffee, I'm missing my coffee. All I had to tell myself was, I can't have coffee with cream now. Once I hit my eight hour window, I could have coffee with cream. Most of the time I didn't want it. That wasn't when I really wanted it. Mm -hmm. So what I did, I started making better choices more often. So it wasn't that I can't have it, I just can't have it now. And so sometimes if I got to the tri-rail station, the transfer station from the metro to the tri-rail, and I knew I had about 15 minutes until the train was coming, I would run over to the Anytime Cafe and I would get a corte dito because it was during my eight hour window and I could have it. But you know, I only had it a couple of times a week, if at all. So with your... 
So with your intermediate fasting, right? Like from one to nine is when you would eat. So in the morning, you would still have black coffee. Like when you woke up, you'd still have black coffee. So when I wake up, I can tell you, I, my first thing that I do is I drink, um, well, I drink eight ounces of water when I, after I brush my teeth and I take my, my supplements, whatever. And then I have a cup of hot water with apple cider vinegar. And I drink it like a cup of tea. And then when I'm done with that, then I have two cups of black coffee with my cinnamon. And then I switch over to iced tea. And I can tell you, since I've been working from home, I drink a pitcher of iced tea every day. I have green tea. <coughs> I'm drinking it right now. But I find that 50%, this is the next piece, 50% of the time you mistake thirst for hunger. So what happens is half of the time when you think you want to eat, you're really not hungry, you're thirsty. And if you would just drink something, it would satisfy you and you'd realize, oh yeah, I really didn't need anything, all right? So that's one of the tricks, is drinking first. You had a question? I don't know if somebody raised their hand. Yes, uh, it's, can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yeah, okay, good. Um, uh, my name is Mary. Um, I've tried intermittent fasting before, and my husband and I have, uh -huh. before, and cancer the first time we tried it was perfect um but the second time we went for it because i'm at home and then i have my son that i have to give him breakfast and he's taking snack breaks and things like that uh -huh. it triggers me to like pull something in usually either if it's not water i would do maybe juice but I've heard with fasting that you cannot have any sugar when you're in that bracket of time. How Correct. true is that? Correct. So the juice does, it, that breaks the fast, right? So you want to do either water, iced tea, black coffee, any of those things. So okay. what, so here's a part of it though. So we're talking about the fasting, keeping that, that eight hour window. Then you also mm -hmm. have the hydration. So maybe you're really thirsty and not hungry. The next thing is, because we set up environmental cues. Remember Pavlov and his dog? You know, he showed him a steak, he rang a bell, the dog salivated. After a while, you didn't even need the steak, he just rang a bell and the dog was salivating. I got a dog sitting here that probably just peed in the other room. That's another story. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's old, he doesn't know. It's all right, Dr. Opozo's dog was crying last time. Um, well, she's, got, she's got the puppy. The cute and, I've got, puppy. <laughs> and I've got this old man. Wait a minute, let me show you. Come here. This is Lewis. Oh, he's oh, cute. He's, cute. Oh, he's so old. He's 16 and a half. And um, oh. actually, he's not mine. I've been fostering him for the last, this, today is eight weeks that I've had him. His owner is very oh. sick. And in the hospital and he may wind up being mine but i don't take bets on who's gonna last longer <laughs> it's all another story but he's so sweet so okay have you one. ever have you ever heard of celsius no I, um, it's, except it's for actually a green tea it's so oh, i'm sure you, you know like red bull obviously it's like right, right, right. An energy drink but it's all natural and it's made with green tea so how many I, calories are in it though hold on i'm about to tell you right now <laughs> <laughs> i'm about to check it out um, wait for Tracy, when you said about the, um, the vinegar and the water, uh -huh. it has to be warm water or can it well, be just okay. like, so, so I know people that just do a shot of vinegar. You don't want to do that because it's going to screw up your esophagus. It's going to screw up the enamel on your teeth. I dilute okay. it by putting it in the hot water just because I pretend it's a cup of tea, but I do put Splenda with it. So it's a weird tasting tea, but, but I get to buy it. And when I've gone to the dentist, I've been doing that for almost three years now, but when I go to the dentist, I always say to the hygienist, how do my teeth look? She's like, they're fine. I'm like, no, like the enamel, is it okay? And she's like, yeah, why? Okay, I just want to make sure. But it, because you're diluting it, it's not hurting anything and it's not burning. And what would be the ratio of that of I water? Do, to so I have my, my coffee mug is 10 ounces. And I put two capfuls of the apple cider vinegar in, and then the rest of it filled with the water. So, so yeah. it only is 10 calories. Yeah, but that's still 10 calories for how much? 
one package. Yeah, I mean, in the um, in the fasting phase, you I don't think you want to do more than five calories. That stinks. <laughs> well, well, okay. So here's the other thing. Okay, so we're talking about Pavlov and his dog, right? So we set up environmental cues, right? If right. I, so I'm sitting in my kitchen right now. If I move over there to that sofa and I have my television, right? And I'm sitting on the tel on the sofa and I'm eating while I'm watching television. Every time I walk over there, I'm going to start thinking about what should I have to eat subconsciously. I don't even realize I'm doing it, but right. because that's what I'm used to, it's I'm setting up a cue. Um, but what I actually do is I always have my glass of iced tea sitting over there. So when I walk over to sit down, oh, here, let me go get something to drink. And it reminds me to drink more. Okay. There's only two rooms of the house you should associate with food, the kitchen and the dining room. So if you're mm -hmm. sitting in your family room watching television and eating, that's not the right room. You should be in the kitchen and the dining room, and it should not be standing over the sink. You should be sitting at the table. Right. If you take food into your bedroom at night, uh, your bedroom is only supposed to be for two things. <laughs> <laughs> what is for sleeping? See, yeah. and that's the other thing. If you can't sleep at night, you're not supposed to be laying in bed like, oh, I can't fall asleep. Because now you're going to associate every time you walk into the bedroom, I can't sleep. If you can't sleep at night, get up and move to a different room, read a book, do something. And then when you're feeling tired, go back because your, your bedroom is not supposed to be where you're supposed to be awake. It's for sleeping and that other thing. Mm. Okay. Um, <laughs> so we set up environmental cues for lots of things, right? So here I am sitting in my kitchen. This is my workspace where I am right now. And so all day long, I'm sitting here working and now it's one o'clock and it's time to eat lunch. Mm -hmm. I don't want to associate work with lunch. So what do I do? I get up out of this chair and I walk around to the other side of the table and I sit there because I have to separate my workspace from my eating space. I don't want to see working from home, it's harder. Right. And that's yeah. why I'm saying, even if I'm sitting at the kitchen table watching television, that's still better than sitting on the sofa watching television and eating because I'm very aware of what I'm doing sitting at the table. So there's lots of things that you can do that are not really nutrition related, but they're behavior related that can make a difference. Exercise is huge. Now, let me tell you, I broke my, my Fitbit a couple years ago and all this, and I run marathons, old, slow, but I run marathons with the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society team and training. I've been coaching for years. Um, so I run, but I was gaining weight. And I'm like, oh my God, this is horrible. And then it dawned on me that I didn't have my Fitbit anymore. So when I bought a new Fitbit and I noticed, because my goal was to get 10,000 steps every day, I, I was hard. I was getting like 6,000 steps. Well, no wonder you're sitting on your ass. No wonder you're not looking, losing weight. You're not moving. So I, that was a big wake up call. You can't fix a problem that you don't recognize. You have to first identify it and then you can work on fixing it, right? So I realized, okay, I got to start moving more. Well, the Fitbit, I set it that I have a goal from 5 a.m. to 6 p.m. I have to move, I have to take at least 250 steps every hour. Now, even if I did that, that would still not get me to my goal of 10,000 steps. But it's a reminder when I'm sitting here, if I haven't gotten 250 steps that hour, at 10 minutes of the hour, it vibrates. And it says, get up and move. And I go, Oop. and I, if I was at work, I would like run down the hallway or I would go in the stairwell up and down real quick just to like clear my head and get moving again. When I started working from home, I realized at uh, six o'clock at night, I got... 4,000 steps because I've been sitting at this chair a whole time. So then I started having to go and run. I'd run, I'd go upstairs. It was late. I'd run upstairs, change my clothes and get out there and run. Then it became 106 degrees with the heat index at six o'clock at night. Well, I can't run in that. Good excuse not to be running. And then I realized, you know what? If I'm not zooming and I'm talking to a patient on my phone, I don't need to be sitting here. So now I start pacing. And I promise you, every patient that I talk to while I'm on my phone, I am pacing back and forth 
between my living room and dining room. And like right now, I did more Zooms than anything, but I'm at 8,260 steps right now because I have done a, you know, some pacing today, but I need to get to my 10,000 steps. It's a reminder. So there's lots of little things that you can do that make a big difference. Small changes make a big difference. If you try to do it all at once, it, nothing gets done. Pick one thing, get good at it, and then add the next piece. Sophia, you have a question? <laughs> I do. I'm in Arizona. I'm not in Miami, but mm -hmm. um, I, I have the BRCA2 gene mutation. I do take tamoxifen uh -huh. and, um, and I am estrogen and progesterone positive. Which is now, why uh -huh. so, <laughs> so last week when they removed my tubes, they did biopsy on them. And um, they, on one of the tubes, they found a tubal endometrosis. Oh, uh huh. So my quit. I mean, that's very new to me. I have. I'm like, how did I get that in there? Uh, the doctor, the surgeon, the oncologist, surgeon, um, gynecologist. Uh -huh. she, when she called me for the results, she said, "Were you in any pain before?" And I said, "No, I've never been in pain." So she said, "That's good, because some women do get pain from it, and others don't." But that that was a conversation. There was no. Okay, these foods trigger endometriosis. I'm a little bit like, what should I do? Like, is there certain foods I should avoid? Is it, is it the foods I'm eating that's causing this? Look at that cutie. I'm sorry, I am listening to you, but I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. So, I am. so what you want to remind yourself, if you think about that, that two thirds, one third, try to go more plant-based, which is anti-inflammatory. When there's inflammation, there's pain. When there's pain, there's inflammation. So if you can do more plant-based foods, and then the other thing is, this goes back with the weight stuff. If I just eat carbohydrates, my blood sugar shoots up, I burn it off, my blood sugar drops, I'm draggy, I'm cranky, I'm running on empty, I don't know what I want, I start picking and I overeat. If I combine protein with my carbohydrate, that combination is harder to break down. So instead of a quick spike and a drop, I get a more constant, even energy level. So I'm satisfied longer, so I'm not going to be picking so much. Now, protein is important because if you're losing weight, you're not just breaking down fat, you're breaking down lean muscle. And that's going to make you feel weak and tired, but it also is a, um, it affects your metabolism. So you want to maintain muscle mass. You need your protein, all right? Put protein and carbs together. I wouldn't eat an apple as a snack because it's just carbs. But what if mm. I took an apple, cored it, cut into wedges, and put a little peanut butter on it? Now I've got protein mixed with my, app, with my carb. Mm. Or maybe I nibble on baby carrots, bell peppers, cucumbers, and I dip them into hummus. And the hummus mm -hmm. is my garbanzo bean, which is a protein. So I'm using plant-based foods, anti-inflammatory. And the other thing is eating a rainbow. I'm the rainbow lady eat a variety of color. Food has different colors because of the nutrients in them, and those nutrients are beneficial for lots of different conditions. So for instance, when you eat blue and purple foods, blueberries, blackberries, eggplants, purple onions, grapes, plums, they have antioxidants to fight against cancer. They're anti-inflammatory. They're good for cognition. If you've had chemo brain, that's been documented. That's a real thing. But the blue and purple foods actually may help you to focus better. They're also good for heart health. Um, when it comes to reproductive health, actually orange foods are good, like turmeric and cantaloupe and sweet potatoes. So think of the rainbow. Eat a variety mm -hmm. of color. You don't have to eat every food listed, but just you know, eat a variety of color every day and try to lean more towards a plant-based diet. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> if you want, if you want, take my email address. Yes. Send me an email and I'll, I'll send you some handouts. Okay. Thank you so much. I will. I appreciate it. Anytime. Does anybody else have any questions? Going back to what she was saying about her, um, I don't know if it was endometriosis where she had or if it was yes. if they found endometriosis in the tubes. Because that's why I had my hysterectomy because um, of issues with endometriosis. And I had to go through a lot of medicines because I had to do IVF because I had endometriosis. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't do it naturally. So, and with 
would that be an issue, the things that we eat? Because I still have a lot of pain. And, and the doctor told me endometriosis doesn't go away. You could, you know, it, it will maybe with medicine be better, but it doesn't go away. So, so how you were telling her about the orange fruits and stuff, you know. So right. Again, I think, you know, if you start looking at what you're eating, you want low fat animal proteins and you want to eat a variety of color and always combine protein with your carbohydrates, but leaning more towards that plant-based diet. Like if you wanted to make a smoothie, one of my favorite things, um, if you took Greek yogurt, Greek yogurt is a great protein, all right? If you buy, like right now I have the Oikos triple uh, zero. It's got 15 grams of protein in the little five ounce cup. The why I like it so much, it's got probiotics. And we know that those probiotics cluster around the GI tract and help with digestion. So if I took that little five ounce cup of Greek yogurt, put in the blender, and then I need to put milk in there. But again, I'm not a big fan of dairy. Greek yogurt, yes, but what do I do about dairy? Well, if I use almond milk, there's only like one gram of protein in a cup of almond milk. Cow milk has eight grams of protein. But wait, I'm in my kitchen. Let me show and tell. One second. She's awesome. She is. I like her personality. Yeah. She is. I love her. <laughs> this is not that crappy wine I used to sneak in junior high. <laughs> Ripple dairy. Ripple. It's a plant-based dairy alternative in Publix in the refrigerated section next to the almond and the soy milk. All right. This is made out of a pea protein. In one cup, it has eight grams of protein, just like cow milk, but it's plant-based. Now this comes in four flavors. This one is unsweetened. I like milk to taste like milk. Then there's original, then there's vanilla, then there's chocolate. All of them have eight grams of protein. The other ones have extra sugar added. This one has zero sugar and less than one gram of carbs, all right? So if I took this milk, poured it into my blender with my little five ounce cup of vanilla Greek yogurt, and then I put in a serving of fruit and made a smoothie out of it, two thirds, one third, right? Yeah, this but if I'm not doing fasting, I should have it in the morning. This would not <laughs> be during your fasting. This could be, you know, maybe after you do a workout, this is a good way to uh, do recovery, you know, because you want to build up. Here's why I ask you this. My husband and I are trying to lose weight together. Uh -huh. He wakes up at five in the morning before he goes to work he takes a ride or a run maybe two three miles yes. and does a smoothie in the morning pretty sure it's with milk and he puts banana whatever he has uh -huh. he puts fruit um but if we do the fasting then what can you do so it would not be good for him because he works out right so you just so i i run like on the weekends, I run in the morning. So I'm running on, on empty. I mean, I'm running on my, I'm using my fat as my source of energy. And actually I've gotten faster. So it's more efficient. So you can, you can do the fasting and do your exercise. And then later on, you know, then you can have, if you want to do the smoothie later, you know. Mary, let's try this fasting thing. I hate breakfast. Come on. <laughs> Let's start it in the group. Maybe we can get like a couple girls where we could all check in to kind of see. I love breakfast, but I, 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 could, I, I, could, I could be without it. I mean, I I've done I love breakfast, but I eat breakfast for dinner sometimes. Because, good, yes, I, I, I just have to have it for, for breakfast. I like breakfast foods. I could wait till four o'clock in the afternoon to eat every day. Like I ate today a turkey sandwich because I was starving at like 4.45. I like scarfed down a six inch turkey sub because I was starving. Well, but see, you still need to eat. And you have to remember you need your protein because when you lose weight, like I said, you don't just break down fat, you're breaking down lean muscle. And when your muscle breaks down, then you gain weight, you gain fat. And, and then when you lose weight, you lose fat and muscle. And then you gain weight, you gain fat. When you keep yo-yoing, that ratio of lean muscle to fat gets wider and wider. And that's why it's harder and harder to lose weight the next time, because that's what your metabolism is linked to. So you always want to have that muscle mass, which is either eating good sources of protein and or exercising to build up the muscle. 
so that you're burning calories at a faster rate when you're sitting around doing nothing. I, I want to try the that. I think I'm trying intermediate. Tracy. <laughs> Yes. And I think, and I think you can change the timing because I'm doing intermediate fasting. I went to the, um, the, the dietitian from when I was diagnosed with my cancer, they did schedule an appointment and she did do intermediate fasting. And the way that I'm doing it is like from 12 PM until 8 PM. And then right. I don't eat, right. I don't you eat your until hours. 12 PM again. So yeah. I eat in between 12 and eight. Okay. I don't know that schedule. Right, I do yeah, want to eleven eight seventeen. Right. Yeah. So you that's the that's the joy of it. Like if you really love breakfast and you say I'm good if I don't eat after six o'clock at night, then you you start at an earlier time. Yes. You just make it work around your schedule. That's mm -hmm. the nice part about it. But it's evidence based, you know. So perfect. Well. I sure appreciate your time and coming on tonight and sharing all this good information with us. And thank you for having conversation and carrying on. And well, no problem. And I just noticed I'm like, I'm slow and old. Stevia okay with black coffee? Yes, it is. Whoever asked that. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, Stevia is fine. And yeah, you just don't want sugar. You don't want something that's got the actual calories. Okay. So basically, you're saying under five calories, and we're good to go in the morning for a yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I'm telling you, I sprinkle. I mean, it's like a pinch of cinnamon I put in with the coffee, and it brews through. It takes.